Good morning, everyone. All right. Good morning. Happy New Year. Not bad. Not bad at all. It is wonderful to see you all this morning. And first things first, um, I want to give a shout out and join me in uh, saying thank you to DBOP. It's the ARC student jazz band who've been entertaining you this morning. Right over here. Nice job. Thank you very much. So on behalf of all of my colleagues at ARC, I want to welcome you to the college and to this spring's convocation. So uh, I think let's get started uh, with seeing who's in the house this morning. Starting with, let's see, who, let's see, the, those from the college furthest away from where we are here. So Folsom Lake, let's hear some noise. All right, CRC. <laughs> All right, Sac City, let's hear it. All right, great. And district office. Small but mighty. All right, and those with the home field advantage, ARC. All right. Thank you, Dan. I also want to I also want to welcome all of those who are joining us uh, via live stream. So I uh, appreciate that. And I also very important. I join me in acknowledging all those who can't be here this morning, uh, particularly our counseling faculty, our frontline staff, who are busy helping our students get ready for the spring term. So let's give them a round of applause. So it is. Standing up here, it is just amazing and uh, just feels great to see all of you here. And I'll tell you, when we think about the changes that are taking place at our colleges, the district, our system, state, and even the nation, I can't think of a better and more important time for us to come together uh, in conversation as we continue to collaboratively shape our future. And so let's get started with that. And to do so, I'd like to invite to the podium the Chancellor of the Los Rios District, Brian King. This is a big deal, isn't it? It is so exciting to be here together with the largest gathering of faculty and staff in the history of the Los Rios District. All of you are a part of history today, and history cannot be made without the contributions of many people. And I want to start off in an attitude of gratitude, thanking a large number of people who have made today possible. And I want to ask you to stand, so, uh, and stand until everyone has been introduced so we can give you the thanks that you deserve collectively. First of all, our faculty and classified leaders who have been encouraging us to meet district-wide for the last several years. Stand up if you are among those who for the last two or three years have been telling us it's time to do this together again. You know who you are. Stand up some of our leaders who have been encouraging us to come together. And re please remain standing. Remain standing. Next, our ARC team. So many people from American River College have worked very hard to make today possible. From the ARC operations office, including Cheryl, Matthew, Erica, and especially the custodial and maintenance staff who have been busy not only with convocation, but also bringing new facilities online for a new semester. And uh, as fate would have it, there was a power outage this week. So we're covered today. We have generators. Nothing is going to stop us today. But the ARC Operations Office, all of you please stand. Also, the ARC IT team and the AV staff, stand and please remain standing. Next, the ARC Communications and Information Services team, including the graphic design staff led by Scott Crow. Please stand and remain standing. We're here in a facility used by the kinesiology department. Let's thank the kinesiology team at ARC for allowing us to use the space and for their help in getting ready today. I want to thank our faculty planning group. Please stand and remain standing. Edward Hashina from ARC, Georgine Hodgkinson from CRC, Chrissy Brown from FLC, and Norman Lorenz from Sac City College. 
also want everyone who is leading and participating in a breakout session today to stand. The leaders of our eight tremendous breakout sessions, will you stand so we can acknowledge you? And last but not least, I want to thank two people from the Chancellor's Office who have been working literally night and day for quite a while to make this happen. Uh, Gabe Ross, our Associate Vice Chancellor, and Jennifer DeLucchi from the Chancellor's Office. Let's give them a warm round of applause. So thank you to everyone who has made today possible. It's an exciting day. It's a historic day. And as Thomas mentioned, we also have many people around the district who are watching live now in our streaming presentation. So I'd love to hear from some of you who are streaming. Shoot me an email. Let, let me know how things are going as the day continues from our streaming presentation. For the rest of the day, get some housekeeping details out of the way immediately. When our general session concludes today at 11 a.m., proceed directly to your first breakout session, the session you registered for, and just a heads up, there was such demand for some of our breakout sessions, many will be full. So if you did not register for a session and, and still want to attend, check that session, but go on with an understanding that the room may be full. That's a wonderful problem to have, that there's su such excitement for some of our breakout sessions that will have overflow. Following the morning breakout sessions, certainly one of the highlights of the day will be the departmental lunches where our faculty and staff are coming together from across the district to talk about common interests and opportunities. Lunches will be delivered to the room based on registration, so your lunch will follow you to the session to which you registered. After you get your lunch, if it makes sense for the departmental session to break into smaller groups, we encourage and support you in making that decision. After lunch is done, the second breakout session will begin promptly. If you want to know where to go and how to get there, all of you have the program. Hold up your program. In your program is the list of the breakout sessions and also a map of ARC. And some were sharing with me, you can actually use some of the applications if the map doesn't work for you to, to be guided to the room where your breakout session is taking place. After the breakout session is done, it's wonderful for all of us to be together, but we're not going to come back and be together at the end of the day. After your last breakout session is completed, that will conclude our time together today want to also make some other introductions that it has been many years since we have come together as a district with uh, over 1,500 people participating. But many of you know that we have a district team that meets every Tuesday that includes uh, leaders from across the district, and I want to acknowledge them. You heard from one of our four presidents, Thomas Green, our host today. I want to acknowledge our other college presidents, Ed Bush. And our two new outstanding presidents, Whitney Yamamura at Folsom Lake and Michael Gutierrez at Sac City. Also from our district team, our Vice Chancellor, Teresa Matista. Vice Chancellor, Jamie Nye. Our General Counsel, J.P. Sherry. And Associate Vice Chancellors Paula Allison and Gabe Ross. Normally at our convocations, you only get to see one member of our Board of Trustees, sometimes two. Today we have a great representation from the best Board of Trustees in the state of California. I want to acknowledge those who are with us. John Knight. Robert Jones. the newest member of our Board of Trustees, Tammy Nelson. And now I want to introduce our Board Chair, Pamela Haynes. Pamela was first appointed to the Board in 1999, so she has been serving our district for a long time. She was elected to her seat in 2000. This is her third term as Board President. She also serves on the Los Rios Foundation Board. Pam has a background in K-12 and higher education policy, as well as economic and community development. She has consulted and provided program evaluation, technical and strategic planning for nonprofits and community-based organizations. She has a, a bachelor's degree from UCLA and a master's degree in public administration from Harvard. She is a proud Santa Monica City College transfer student. So she has been a student in our California community college system. 
Please join me in welcoming President of the Los Rios Board of Trustees and also a member of the State Board of Governors, Pam Haynes. Good morning, Los Rios. Are you in the house? So I want to thank the chancellor for that introduction. It was much too long. Um, but on behalf of the entire Los Rios Community College District Board of Trustees, it is my pleasure and honor to be here today at American River College to help kick off the spring semester with the first district-wide Los Rios Convocation in more than 10 years. As many of you know, I have the honor of serving, as the Chancellor said, as a Los Rios board member, but also serving on the California Community College Board of Governors. I'd like to take a moment to recognize one of our own who also serves with me as a member of the Board of Governors. He is among us. He um, is faculty at Cosumnes River College. He is a man, and I'm, I'm, I'm using that, I'm using his first name, but I'm using it. He is a man who is vocal and respected, and a respected voice on the Board of Governors. Man Bon, would you please stand up and be recognized? So in both capacities, as a trustee on Los Rios and as a member on the Board of Governors, my colleagues and I are fo focused on helping to create the policies and frameworks to allow you all to help our students reach their goals, their aspirations, their dreams. Part of that work is sharing the great things that are happening at all of our colleges so that the best ideas can be taken to scale in order to have a greater impact. That's why today is so exciting. We spend a lot of time in Los Rios, and rightly so, celebrating what makes our colleges and communities so unique and special. But as I look out on this large room full of talented, hardworking faculty and staff from throughout the district, I'm reminded that there is much, much more about our work that connects us then separates us. First and foremost, for all four of our colleges, there is, a co there is commitment to putting students at the center of everything we do. The students we serve come from every possible walk of life, and each of their stories is different. Yet we have the responsibility of serving each and every one of them when they come through our doors, and I would also add, through our portals. While we are, while we, while, excuse me, while we are at different places with the work, all four of our colleges have begun to implement guided pathways. But I'm inspired by the work at our colleges so far and invigorated by the opportunity that Pathways Work presents for our students. All four of our colleges are in the midst of rethinking placement and assessment, using data in more creative and robust ways to help our students be more successful. Transformational change, disruptive innovation, collective impact is hard. I'm the first to admit that. And, and you're in the field and you know that it's hard. But I am inspired by the collaborative work being undertaken with supportive services within and between departments, across disciplines, within and across our colleges in recognition of our students and their needs. There is no doubt that the landscape is changing rapidly, and I applaud you all for being at the forefront of this effort. All four of our colleges are made up of smart and creative faculty and staff who are here this morning and the thousands of others who could not be here today. You are dedicated, passionate, courageous enough to take risks for our students. My fellow board members and I are truly grateful for all that you do. So as we prepare for another semester, I stand here today excited and energized about what lies ahead at our colleges. On behalf of my colleagues on the board, I'd like to thank you for being here today and for your commitment to our students. I know that it's time, it's, this is a time of great change 
at our colleges and around the state. And all of that change can be unsettling. In times like these, organizations can either run and hide or they can step forward and lead. I am proud and privileged to represent a district of leaders. Thank you. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce the president of our district, Academic Senate, Carlos Lopez. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. I want to quickly take, make a shout out to the people sitting in the bleachers. That's where I would be if I did not have this responsibility. <clears throat> I'd like to take some time to introduce my entourage. <clears throat> Behind me, we have Paula Haug, Professor of Communications, Folsom Lake College. We have Shannon Mills, Professor of Anthropology from Cosumnes River College. We have Troy Myers, Professor of English from Sacramento City College. And our returning champion, Gary Aguilar, Professor of Design Technology, here from American River College. These are all the academic senates from the different community, from the four community colleges in the district. So thank you for supporting me. They're, they're behind me in case I, I need their help. Uh, so hopefully, uh, usually convocation marks the end of a vacation. And so here I am with the news that we're about to start another semester. <laughs> hopefully your break was enjoyable and you worked on Canvas because it's real now. <laughs> it's been a while since we met as a group, as a district, and I, I wanna echo the, the gratitude from the Chancellor, all those people that were involved. Thank you very much. It's important for us to gather. Uh, today's focus is on pathways, and, and I wanna take a moment, we, we will get to that, but I, I, the last time we gathered, we had a different chancellor, and, and I really used to look forward to convocations because I would always hear about Petey and Frankie, the, the students in Mrs. Harris's fifth grade class, do you remember? So for no reason at all, I'd like to share the coincidences that my wife is also a teacher, and, and she shares stories with me, so I have a couple I'd like to share with you. One, one is when she was a kindergarten teacher. Uh, in the first two or three days, she noticed there was this, this, this child, we'll call him Frankie. <laughs> and he, he just wasn't engaged. He wasn't doing the work. He really wasn't involved. And, and as my wife approached him and, and asked, his response was, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> my dad did it. <laughs> just before the break, uh, my wife received some very touching and moving letters from her students. This is in a first grade class. And, uh, and one was very, very moving and, and she became emotional as she read it and, and she actually said, I don't know if I can read this. And Petey, who was in the back and always has solutions for all problems said, just sound it out. <laughs> <laughs> I love Petey and Frankie. <clears throat> I, I was not invited here to share about my wife's students. I, I am, as the District Academic Senate President, we do have a responsibility and we meet the first and third Tuesday of every month in the main conference room. You're all welcome to attend. And one, one of our roles is really to represent faculty and to protect the 10 plus one, anything that's academic and professional in nature. We, as a Senate, will make recommendations to the board and um, we, we take that very seriously. We have committees that help us do this work and we, there's a lot of meetings to help us do the work and we are there. And we, I wanna say thank you to all the faculty that participate. It, it involves a lot of people. So I, on behalf of the Academic Senate presidents standing behind me, we are grateful to those that answer the call when we make rec a request for, for people to appoint. We're gathered really with the focus on guided pathways and uh, I'd like to take a moment and say uh, one of the other things we do is we attend board meetings 
and those are fun. Uh, <laughs> and we, you know, I look forward to um, the, the chancellor's report because they come at the end <clears throat> of, of the meetings and there's always something positive and then the retirements are announced. So uh, it's always impressive to hear how many years people serve in the district. And this last December, we heard of probably the most impressive one we have heard, Bud Hannon. Can you please stand up? <laughs> Bud Hannon, professor of psychology from, there he is, from Kasemnes River College, retiring after 47 years of service to this district. 47 years. Bud, please stand up again. <laughs> Well-deserved ovation. Congratulations. So it would be impressive to sit down and talk with Bud about all the changes that have happened in 47 years. I could list a few, like computers, <laughs> cell phones, chalkboards. Anyone remember those? I could go on. but. What, what, what is hard to deny is that the, the pace of change, and he could, he could attest to this, has just accelerated tremendously recently. And I don't think it's gonna change. And so, really, I'm here on behalf of faculty to say that we will be involved. We have been, we will be, we are now. And so, uh, it has to do with, uh, let me pause. One of our responsibilities is to attend Academic Senate for California Community Colleges plenary sessions. Uh, and these, these are gatherings where delegates from each of the California Community Colleges make decisions, take positions on everything that is academic and professional in nature. And in the fall, we, we, had, we passed five resolutions on guided pathways. And I don't want to bore you and read each one of them, but I will, I will encourage you to read that you could go to ASCCC.org and see all the resolutions that were passed. But I'd like to highlight two of them and then mention the other three. One talks about creating areas of focus and meta majors, which is a key component of guided pathways. And it really encourages academic senates to remember that faculty have primacy over, uh, under the 10 plus one, we, we decide what these will be. So when creating meta majors and areas of focus, faculty need to be at the table. We need to lead that uh, project. There was another one, thank you. There was another one <clears throat> that said, okay, the academic senate is, the acad academic senates must appoint anyone involved in creating the framework for guided pathways for the college, including those that will receive reassigned time for their efforts. So again, we, we will be involved, we have been. The other three, one, one is it encourages us to really consider whether we wanna be part of the California Guided Projects Award Program. We all submitted applications for that, is that right? All four colleges independently applied for that. The other encourages librarians to participate in the framework, because librarians are cool. <laughs> so in closing, I, I, I just wanna say, uh, give a big thank you to all faculty that are involved, and I wanna encourage those that aren't yet involved to please consider participating. As we hear today's, uh, the, the next part of the program, I'll remind you that this is a call to action, to action for us faculty. Unfortunately, the way things are headed, if we're not involved, things will happen to us. And I don't know that any of us want that. So it's better for us to be at the table and take our role. It's a right and a responsibility to protect the 10 plus one. If you don't know what those are, see me. I'll be happy to show them. So uh, I'd like to introduce Olga Prishpilov now to come to the stage. She is the Classified Senate President for American River College. Olga.
Good morning. So my name's Olga. I'm the Classified Senate President for American River College. To my left is Jennifer Patrick, the Classified Senate President for Kissimmee River College. And joining us live are Vani Shane, Folsom Lake Classified Senate President. And Robert Kelly, Sac City Classified Senate President. On behalf of all four of us, I'd like to say that we are very proud of what the classified employees are doing on all four campuses. We are very happy that um, the whole idea of faculty versus classified is pretty much a myth at Los Rios, am I right? It's not versus, it's with. <laughs> So today I'd like you guys to imagine something. Think back to maybe a conference that you went to recently. You've been working really hard for maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe 20. And then you go to this conference and you're, you're just so worn out, you're pretty close to just quitting your job, you're really tired, you've been working at your 200% this whole time, you don't think anyone understands you. And then you show up to this conference and usually it's a conference in your field and all of these professionals are talking about things that you've been experiencing. And you know exactly what they're talking about. They know about that student who sits in the back of the class on their phone the whole time. They know about the student who's rude to you that entire time. They know exactly what you're going through because they're going exactly through the same thing. And you start talking to them and it just lifts your soul. Because you know there's someone else out there who's experiencing the same thing and there's someone who, who supports you. And then when you leave the conference, you have someone to call if you need help, and you have someone to just think about when you're struggling. I'll share a personal example. And you guys will probably know who I'm talking about. Um, so this fall semester, there was one point that I was a little bit stressed out, a little bit tired, a little bit nervous, all kinds of things, you know? It was one of those situations where things aren't just just aren't going too great. And then this person calls me. She calls me and she says, Olga, I wasn't at that meeting that, that the email was talking about, but you know, I support you 100%. I'm sure you did everything right. <laughs> and then she said, do you want me to send an email to everyone and tell them that? <laughs> And whether or not I did everything right, just that level of support just lifted my spirit and I kept going. So I'd like today to be that type of experience for us as we see our colleague, colleagues from around Los Rios share about your struggles and especially share about the wins, share about the amazing things you're doing so that we can all be happy with you. Thank you. Let's thank all of our speakers. <laughs> Carlos, when you were talking about stories involving kids, my mother was a first grade teacher. How many of you have a first grade teacher somewhere in your family tree? So her stories uh, really resonate in my mind. And one story that she told that I really liked was she had recess duty one day, and a little boy walked up with tears streaming down his face. Something had happened to him. And he looked at my mother in all sincerity when she said, what happened? And you know what he said? That boy I threw a rock at hit me. <laughs> now, most of us can identify with that experience for someone else. But how many times in our own life have we been partly responsible for conditions that led to a predictable outcome and were surprised by it? As we come together today, many of us would like a respite from the rapid change of the last few years at the national level, at the state level, and even at the local level. But we all know the reality is the rate of change is not slowing down. It probably is going to speed up. And we need to step up and be ready to make sure that these forces for change lead to positive outcomes for our students. A voice we have not had an opportunity to hear so far this morning is the voice of our students. We had a chance recently to talk with seven of our students from all four of the Los Rios colleges, and as you might expect, 
they had some wonderful things to say about our colleges and about the faculty and staff who have served them. We also want to listen carefully, though, because they were honest about some areas where we have room for improvement and really uh, underline why, as a district and as four colleges, we are so focused on guided pathways. Let's watch and listen to our students. Hi, my name is Alma Aguilar and I go to Folsom Lake College. My name is Earl Crouchley. I'm a student at American River College. My name is Zena Fayeb and I go to Folsom Lake College. My name is Joshua Robinson. I'm from Sacramento City College. It's Anthony Lawless and I attend Kasumnas River College. My name is Halima Ides and I represent Kasumnas River College. My name is Brenda Soria and I'm from Folsom Lake College. I'm from Honduras. I moved here 10 years ago. So, you know, back in Honduras, education was not the best. So I really didn't know if I wanted to go to college. Upon coming back into college after being out of school for 12 years, I decided to go to American River College because they have one of the best veteran centers in the state. And so I always knew how much of a privilege public education was. So I was always really excited by the school system here in California and knew that that was something that I wanted to pursue at the end of the day. So the enrollment process, it was a little bit difficult. To walk into college and it's a new experience, you don't know what to expect, you don't know what to do. When I got there, most of the classes were already closed or waitlisted, so it was kind of more like, oh, well, let's just hope you get some courses and meet those financial aid requirements. When I went through the financial aid office, I didn't get my financial aid until my second semester in the fall. It was really difficult because I didn't know what to do. No, there wasn't really anybody to show me what to do. I have taken some classes I didn't need. Actually, I took nine and a half units this summer. As a communications major, it would have been a lot more helpful to understand that I only needed to take certain general education classes prior to my actual major classes. I think assessment doesn't really do much of a favor to most students because you have different learners, you have different people at different places. It's stressful as a student to enroll, especially on your own. The classes actually worked out completely for both my major to transfer, and that was completely by luck, now that I think back on it, because I was kind of flying blind, but I knew that I had at least a couple of GEs under my belt, and so I kind of just eyeballed it, and I was like, you know what, this sounds interesting. But I remember there was someone in American River College that kind of guided me through the application and everything, and I think having one-on-one -on -one person helping you is very important. So during my first semester, I had no idea what I was doing at all. I came here my second semester of freshman year, and I didn't know English at all. So, you know, it was really difficult to learn the language, to just, you know, actually get good grades. I kind of struggled a little bit, you know, I started failing some classes, and it's because at that time, I didn't have a goal to obtain. I would come up with some type of system that evaluates students, kind of see what their interests are before they even get asked the question of, what do you want to major in? I can say hands down, my favorite staff member would have to be Dr. Prince White. He was one of the coolest professors just because he took the extra step to try to ensure that his students passed the class. I really like Professor Winchelbaum. He's an English professor. Dr. Arden Ogle, Robert Snowden, Professor John Kloss, he's a sociology professor. One of them is Joy Pearson. I don't even know what she saw in me, but she saw something. And if I forgot one, please, if they're watching this, please, it's nothing bad. Best thing about Sacramento City College is definitely the networking, the different people that you'll meet. The best part of the experience at AR for me has been becoming a part of the community. Pretty much anything that you can think of is available to you at Folsom Lake College. The best part of my experience at CRC is definitely the people that I've met. There's so many different people and personalities. It's changed my perspective on everything. I think the best thing about Folsom Lake College has to be everyone in it. The fact that we all think of ourselves as family, I think that's the most rewarding thing ever. I was very hesitant about going to a community college at first, and it is by far the best thing that has ever happened to me. I feel that I'm definitely set on the right track, and I'm hoping to go in the spring of 2019 to Sac State. I want to get my AA here, AS, and then I want to transfer to Berkeley. So I'm not stopping at my associates. I'm getting my bachelor's, I'm getting my master's, and then I'm getting my PhD for sure. <laughs>
You may ask why guided pathways. I would say that the answer is that our students are telling us that this is the sort of change that they need to help them achieve their goals. Uh, there is certainly funding from the state and sometimes a sense that this is just a fad that's going to pass, but I can assure you that is not the case in Los Rios or in the state of California. The compelling need to meet our students where they are is why we are doing this hard work together. And when we started planning for our district-wide convocation today and a discussion about guided pathways, we thought, who is a speaker who could tell us not only what guided pathways are, but more importantly, how they have worked at other places? So we wanted someone who had experience working with colleges where guided pathways had been implemented and led to fundamental changes in student outcomes. Our next speaker checks that box. We also wanted someone who understood California community colleges very well. And I'm happy to share with you that our next speaker has been involved in California community colleges for many years, has served on the staff at Foothill De Anza College and Skyline College, among other organizations in the state of California, and also the statewide RP group. So he knows California community colleges very well. He also has a deep understanding and appreciation of the points Carlos was making about what we all agree is the vital and essential role of faculty in designing and implementing guided pathways. So I am incredibly excited to introduce our next speaker, Rob Johnstone, to share some observations about successes and opportunities for guided pathways at the Los Rios Colleges. Rob? Okay. So. I actually, uh, I've got to tell you a couple things. One is that um, this is day five of five this week. I started in Texas City, Texas, outside Galveston on Monday with a full day of keynotes and presentations. Tuesday morning, I was at Houston Community College with a keynote. Uh, Wednesday, I did a full day uh, workshop at Columbus State uh, Community College in Ohio. And then yesterday, I started at uh, 7 a.m. Eastern in Benton Harbor, Michigan and uh, did eight hours on site, drove three hours to Chicago, flew here, uh, got in at 12.30 last night to SFO, drove out here, got here around 2.30. So I'm good, <laughs> it's all good. And I had set this week up and I had like, I, I travel the country constantly for this work. I love what I do. I love getting to talk to rooms like this and feeling the energy. And I'll tell you one thing, um, I could just talk for two hours about that six minute video or however long that was. And I gotta tell you one thing about that video. Some of you in the back of your heads are thinking, you know, that's really convenient they found those students who had those problems with those quotes. <laughs> I have seen that video, by the way, in about 30 different forms in about 30 different states. And it always has that exact same conclusion, right? And we're gonna talk about this. So, and then Brian, so I actually didn't have today on my calendar, Brian asked me relatively uh, recently, uh, I get kind of far in advance, and I'm like, Brian, I'm gonna be in Michigan the day before. Like, hard to get here. He's like, it's all right, come on out. And uh, I said, sure, you know, for you guys, California, I'll do this. Like, all right, I'll do it. Um, I'll come in the morning. And then uh, he says, oh, by the way, you got 30 minutes to do what you normally do in two and a half hours. <laughs> Sweet. All right, so I got that going for me. So that's good. So uh, what I'm going to do, actually, is kind of just walk through two pieces of a larger thing that I do on Guided Pathways. And I'm actually not going to talk much about the mechanics of Guided Pathways because we don't have time. I'll get to the big ideas I got at Pathways, but I want to do two things for you. I want to talk about the issues of equity and economic mobility and how a social justice mindset and mission is at the heart of this work. And I'm going to give you some data that suggests that our, we need to even further sharpen our mission of economic mobility in this country in the community college system. We're going to talk about that first. And then, because as a kid I always grew up in the 80s and I always wanted to be a game show host. We're going to have a little bit of fun for a couple minutes, and I'm going to just kind of set the underpinnings for the Guided Pathways movement through a little kind of creative, hopefully creative exercise. So I, first, I want to share with you, I'm a social psychologist. My doctorate is in social psychology. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> you put 900 people in a room, you're going to get one. That's I've got odds. Are, that's good. Yeah, you want to scare, I, I got a whole bunch of rants I got to stop myself from doing in 30 minutes. I, I could ask all the psych majors in the room to raise their hands. And it would be about 15% of the room in most cases. Number two undergraduate major is psychology. And we could talk about that as a guided pathways problem later, too. Um, <laughs> that's actually, we always talk about pre-nursing, but psychology is a similar problem. Uh, so I want to talk about this. Though. So I'm a, I'm a liberal arts guy. I'm a social scientist. I'm a fundamental believer in the idea that economic mobility, when we talk about economic mobility, it's absolutely the case that higher education is about more than economic mobility, 
right? We're all very committed to an educated citizenry. We're committed to lifelong learning. We're committed to a series of liberal arts outcomes that we feel take students through their lives and careers. We're committed to all of those things. That is, and I am 100% behind every single one of the things I just mentioned. But I want to ask yourself the question that's on the board here. What percentage of your students attend your college solely for the love of learning? I want to throw a number out there. I can't hear all of you, but when I ask people to get, put a percentage on this, it's unbelievably consistent what people say in response to this question. And that number hovers around 3%. Right? Now, there's a moan in this room, which is why. Because what do you love? Learning. You work in higher education. You work in academia. You came to this place, whether you're faculty or staff, because you have a fundamental love of learning. And you love your discipline, those of you who are faculty. But we, gotta, we have to maybe take a look at why our students are actually here, right? And the students are actually here as a stepping stone to a living wage for many of them in a career. Well, that doesn't mean, by the way, that a liberal arts education isn't important. Um, I want to give you one data point, though. I did this in Texas uh, last year. I made this point, and I had a woman come up to me afterwards. She was an econ professor. And she said, Rob, I actually ask this question on my survey. I give all of my econ one students on day one. I have a multiple choice question. It's one of the, I do a short 10 item survey. It says, what is the reason you're, in, you're at Alamo Community College in San Antonio, Texas? And this is like an option, one of the 10 options. Oh, I said, this is awesome. I can get some real data. We've been using conjecture. I said, what percentage of students picked it? And she laughed and said, percentage? I've been doing this for 12 years and not a single student has ever chosen that response. <laughs> and I did the math in my head really quickly. I think she'd seen about 3,500 different students and not one had chosen the response. Now, again, I'm going to argue strongly that doesn't mean it's not important. I'm going to try to argue that strongly by showing you the next bullet. That was a cue. Um, I would, but we, the point here is that 98% of your students are career focused at some point. Right? They're career focused at some point. Now, that doesn't mean they need to go directly into the workforce with a short-term certificate, which is cool if that's how they need to start, especially if they're stackable and lead to other things. Or they do what I did, which is go nine straight years and get a bachelor's or master's and a doctorate degree. But at some point, they're going to need a career. And this is especially true, by the way, and I'm going to come back to this liberal arts point in a second, that economic mobility is particularly important if you're poor. Right? It's all sad. If you have unlimited time and unlimited resources, it's great to have a love of learning. Look, how many of us would just get another and another and another doctorate degree if we could? A lot of us, right? We love this stuff. Like astrophysics, cool, I'll take five years to learn that. <laughs> Comparative religion, that sounds cool. Someone pay me to do this, though, because I you know, there's no back end to this, right? So if you're on the lower half of the income spectrum, you need higher education to pay off some. I grew up in East San Jose. I, over in the Bay Area, and I was kind of from the lowest income bracket. And I can tell you that as I was going through Stanford, San Jose State, and the University of Oregon, in the back of my mind, there was a little, one of those things you see running, like uh, the dollar signs continuing to go up, which was my student loan debt. And that was continuing to go up. And I knew in the back of my head, well, this is all really cool, but this better pay off at some point. And I could, by the way, when Brunson New Data just came out on student loan debt, it's very sobering. I don't have time to integrate it today, but look up a Brookings report by Judith Scott Clayton if you want to tell your, talk us about some of the data that's just come out on this. But I also don't want to lose the idea that liberal arts education is incredibly important. I'm going to argue it's more important in 2017 than it was in 1967. Why? Because people are going to change careers four to seven times now, and that was usually one to two times before. We're, we're training people for careers that don't exist yet. So when, not, when, we, when someone gets an accounting degree for us, they learn a heck of a lot about accounting, but the other half of the equation is supposedly a series of liberal arts outcomes. I haven't looked at your gen ed learning outcomes. I don't need to, because they all have some version of these five words, critical thinking, computation, communication, citizenship, and creativity, right? That's all the, it's like a mad libs of institutional learning outcomes, right? <laughs> It's all really cool. That's what we're all working on. And that's what's going to, when someone changes from being an accountant to going into to dental hygiene, what goes with them are those liberal arts outcomes, right? What they learned in accounting is probably not going to go with them too much, maybe a little bit. So I am in no way trying to downplay the role of liberal arts. However, what I am saying is that students need this to pay off. And one thing we have to ask ourselves pretty quickly is, all right, well, who, where are students being served in higher education? So let's talk about equity for a second. When we talk about economic mobility, we need to ask ourselves, if the American dream were valid, at least as in, in uh, at the aspect of access to elite private education, 
So let's look at some elite private schools like Harvard, right? So if Harvard was a, 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 a pro the promise of the American dream was valid, it wouldn't matter how much money your parents made, you'd have an equal chance of going to Harvard. So if we looked at Harvard, and we looked at the income distribution of parents, we would see, I guess if you broke it into quintiles, the American dream would be roughly 20% at all, in all five income quintiles, from the richest to the poorest. So let's look at what actually happens at Harvard. Um, and this, by the way, is a collaboration between those bastions of caring about the poor, Stanford, Brown, Harvard, MIT, and Cambridge, <laughs> who are always right in front when you think about who's on the forefront of the poor. I mean, Berkeley's on the list, which it seems sounds interesting, but I'll tell you a story about that in a second. So these are guys, these guys are great. I can, if there's a whole bunch of data and research on this project, that quality of opportunity. But take a look at Harvard for a second. So here's the income distribution of, of students who go to Harvard. Clearly, this is not 20% across the board. In fact, 70% of the students who went to Harvard, is starting in this is about 2002, although it hasn't changed much, come from the top income quintile, and 15% come from the top 1% who make over $700,000 a year, which is more than the almost the entire bottom three quintiles. Now, Harvard does not have in its mission that is supposed to be uh, a key uh, catalyst in economic mobility, which is good, because they're not. Right? They help the rich become richer, right? And by the way, my former institution, Stanford, got a lot of press uh, for giving low income students making less than $125,000. They'll match the kind of the last dollar for tuition. That's really cool, but I bet you they'd run the numbers first to see that they're also like this. They're only doing it for about 8% of their students, right? It's easy to run this if you know that the vast majority of your students come from here. And by the way, it's not just Harvard, so let's look at some other institutions. If you add in all of the Ivy League schools, plus Chicago, Stanford, MIT, and Duke, and I love this, it's the Ivy Plus. Why? Because these guys are researchers on the project, they want to be included with the Ivy League. So that's really one way to look at that. <laughs> cool, now we haven't, I've never heard this designation before. Um, I will tell you that when I was at Stanford, you know, Veritas is the uh, Harvard motto. It stands for something that I don't know because I don't know Latin. Um, we had t-shirts at Stanford that said Veritas in the front and had the Harvard crest. On the back it said Very Tan, <laughs> which was Stanford in California. Um, so if you look at these 12 colleges taken together, and if you could designate other elite institutions, but these are certainly a list of 12 elite private institutions. 15% of the students from the top 1%, which is greater than the entire bottom 50%. So you are more likely to go to one of these 12 institutions if you're in the top 1% than over the entire 50% at the bottom. And you're 77 times more likely to go to Harvard if you're in the top 1% versus the bottom 20. So clearly, Harvard and these other school types of schools, elite privates, are not the place where we're seeing low-income students go. So where are they going? And there's an interesting story to where they're going. Well, let's look, and I did not do this because I went to Stanford. I tell people around the country, by the way, that like the Stanford Cal rival, there's no real sports rivalries in California. We have too much sun, too many beaches. It just doesn't matter that much, right? This is not Michigan, Ohio State. <laughs> it's not Texas, Oklahoma. I mean, I made, I, I, I'll tell you sometime about some mistakes I made on the wrong side of the Michigan, Ohio State, like rivalry when I was in the other state. I was in Columbus, Ohio. And I once said, uh, you know, really elite public institutions like Michigan. <laughs> As it was coming out of my mouth, I'm like, can you catch this? Because I think that's not going to go very well. Um, so here's Harvard. But let's look at a public, and I didn't do this, by the way, the researchers did. Let's look at a public flagship, which happens to be Berkeley. So we all know, wherever you are politically, it's all cool. But we know Berkeley kind of a bastion of liberalism, bastion of the left. I actually grew up in San Jose. I'm very surprised by this outcome which is at Berkeley, great school, very focused on liberal, liberal, still over 50, 55, 60% of the students come from the top income bracket. Now, we, it's a flagship, right? So this may not be too surprising. So the point is public flagships are not the answer for economic mobility either. For some students, they are. Where do we start finding low-income students? Well, we find them at places, like the gentleman who speaks after me, we find them at Sacramento State, at the regional four-year schools who are doing great work. But this, is a, this happened to be SUNY Stony Brook, which I think is interesting, because Long Island, Stony Brook is not exactly in a poor part of Long Island, right? So they're actually drawing low-income students probably from the Bronx and, and from New York out there. So this is a fascinating finding. But here's where you start seeing low-income students. But where do you really see them? Of course, you see them in community colleges. This is Glendale down in LA. I have to say outside California. Glendale's not exactly the poorest part of Los Angeles, <laughs> right? I mean, this is not really what... But the point here is here's where, this, here's where the students are who are low income. So if you're in the bottom income quintile, you look at, just look at the bars. 
you're far more likely to start in a community college. Now, I work in community colleges. I love community colleges. What's one of the big problems with this as a, kind of when you think about economic mobility is it's the system that has the lowest outcomes overall. Biggest challenge, right, but also the lowest overall outcomes. Now, this is something we're all working on. I think, we're, again, we're setting the table for the Guided Pathways Movement. When I look at this, what it does for me is you may not have got into this field because you wanted to get into it because of economic mobility. Maybe you did. Maybe you came in this thinking, I want to work on translating things to a, a living wage for families in my community. That's awesome if you did. I didn't. But I found this mission when I came to higher ed in 2002 and realized what was going on in the community college sector. And whether you're a, a champ, whatever part of this institution you're a champion of, you're working on economic mobility. All right? You are working on economic mobility. And I think that it sharpens to me the need to change a system that's largely been doing the same thing for 700 years. Right? We get the same outcomes we always get when we do things the same way. We've done that for a long time. We know exactly what we're going to get. And by the way, it does not work for enough low-income students and students of color. Okay? Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit. So one thing about this, by the way, when you talk about low-income students, we often, and look, we're in California, so this is less of a problem here, although it's still a problem. We're very comfortable talking about income and socioeconomic status. Right? We're not as comfortable talking about race. And this is unfortunate. I obviously stand in front of you as a white male. We have to be able to talk about race together, right? It cannot be the province and the responsibility of our faculty and administrators of color to change the conditions for students of color, right? We all got to work on this together. We all got to work on this together. And if, by the way, we say economic mobility because it's a little safer. But when you're talking about economic mobility, you're also talking about race. And if you don't think that they're highly correlated, I want you to do a little research experiment when you have all the free time you have in your life. <laughs> Find me the zip code in this country where on average African American or Latino citizens have a higher median income than white citizens. Because to my knowledge, it does not exist. And I've looked. So this doesn't mean there's not rural white poverty in America. There aren't poor white folks in America. It means that when you're working on economic mobility, you have to layer in the factor of race, call it out, and deal with it. Because it's not just about economic mobility. There's a force of this, it's also about race. And so we don't have time to go into that as much as I would like to, but I want to make sure that we're not just using the code we always use, oh, we're working on income. Well, we're also working on equity. And remember, you guys, in we in California have a better sense of this. Equity is not about equality of access, and it's not about diversity. It's about making sure that the outcomes are the same for students from different backgrounds and for students of color and for low-income students. It's not equal access, it's making sure that the outcomes are the same. And so I, I have a whole rant I don't have time to do on the term achievement gap. And the achievement gap's a really cool term. It's very convenient for us in power because it basically says the student's the problem in the groups who aren't succeeding, right? Right, I, mean, I don't even read Gloria Ladson Billing who like, tried to reframe that term in the mid uh, 2000s as the educational debt the system has accrued to allow these outcomes to be this way. That's pretty freaking cool, by the way. When you start looking at colleges who've reduced the so-called achievement gap, you see that it's systems and structures and cultures at the institution, rather than changing the student, that we need to look at. So, I told you we're going to have some fun, and I could, you can tell I can keep going on this, and it's fun to get applause, so I might just do that. But Now, we're going to have some fun. Name the, oh, it has to come out louder. Get the sound up on the speakers. The sound's really critical to this. We're going to play a couple rounds of Family Feud. That's how we're going to roll. Play a couple rounds of Family Feud. And what we're going to do first, I, I have advisors in the room, and probably a lot of them are out advising right now. We're going to play the first round. Is, the question is, what do new students ask advisors? There we go. Now we're talking. We've got our question. We've got our top six answers on the board. I need my cheat sheet here. What do new students ask advisors? People in the front, preferably. What class should I take? What classes should I take? You guys are starting this off. <laughs> what courses should I take? Points to, the, points to the middle. We could do it by college if I had time, because people like competing, but we're not going to do that. All right, what else? What majors make the most money? What are my career options? How do I match my interest to careers? What can I do with this? What else? How much will it cost? And I heard, how long will it take? 
You guys are good at this. <laughs> what else? How do I sign up? I love that, but you know what I love more? This noise. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Brilliant one, but I love that. How do I sign up? All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you the last two. How much financial aid can I get? And, by the way, I heard them repeating it like they do on the show. That was good. Will my credits transfer? All right, yeah, oh, of course. All right. So does anyone look at this list and think these are unreasonable questions for students at your college to ask? Seem pretty reasonable to me. Okay, let's play uh, another mental exercise. Let, I pick on psychology not because there's anything wrong with psychology, because it's my field, and it's emblematic. No, there's uh, definitely something wrong with psychologists, I will say that. But I mean, it's my field. And the, it's very emblematic of the classic gen ed pre-transfer in a community college milieu, right? It's the, uh, indicative of that. So let's take 10 students in, in spring semester who've been here for three semesters, and they're in a psych one class. We're going to buy them lunch. We're going to do a focus group. So I find 10 students who started in fall, 16. We're going to buy them lunch. And we're going to sit them down. We're going to ask them to do some good focus group work with them. And at the end of that, we're going to ask them these six questions. And show them this list and say, don't show them that guy because that's scary. Show them the list and say, do, how many of you feel like you have really good answers to these questions right now at Insert Your Los Rios College? How many of those 10 you think have good answers to the questions? Remember, they're not in search tech. They're in psychology. Or three. Two, if you do this at most medium to large size community colleges who haven't worked on guided pathways before, the actual number is right around two. So we just said these are really important. We also said students, by the way, don't really very much know the answers to these questions, right? Now, if you have some doubt about whether these questions are important, I want you to ask yourself this. Is there another type of educational institution who provides really good answers to these questions, who are stealing your students left and right for profit institutions, right? Now, I don't have time to go into my rant on the ethics of for-profit institutions, and there's good people who teach at them, some good people who worked at them. That's all true, but we also have to look at their outcomes. Anyone know what the graduation rate for University of Phoenix is, one of the top ones in the country? 20, 16 to 21 percent, depending on the year, right? So what's happening is people are flocking to for-profit institutions. By the way, who flocks disproportionately to for-profit institutions? Low-income students and students of color, right, are flocking to institutions who have the same or lower completion rates, because national average for community college, if you include transfer certificates, degrees, all of those things together, around 35, 37%. We can do better, right? We can absolutely do better. And that's what we're going to work on. But so students are flocking to a series of institutions because of these answers. Because they're told, not the sixth one, by the way, they're not told at all, but the first five are the entire value proposition of for-profit institutions. And if we have more time, I want to talk a little bit about the value proposition. They're leaving you because they don't understand their value proposition with you. It's not clear to them why they're here. You heard it from the students, right? I didn't have a focus. I was just taking some courses. I got a whole rant I do on bartenders telling me they're just taking some courses at the Low School Community College. I mean, a lot of brew pubs around the country as I travel 200 days a year. I had to clarify that before it got too far. I, mean, like, I saw what was happening there. I was like, oh, yeah, good, 900 people. You're just talking about bartenders. That's great. Um, so those are really important questions. They're flocking to for-profit institutions, by the way, which obviously cost more. It's great that they give financial aid at for-profit institutions, but it costs 10 times as much. So even after, it still costs four times as much. I just saw some data this morning that talked about the default rate of students and for-profits, new data on default rates, and that any student who has had any experience at a for-profit institution in this country has a 43% student loan default rate. It's 11% for publics, right? And because disproportionately low-income students and students of color are going to for-profit, so now there's ethical discussions we could have here, but what I'm most interested in is this value proposition is really, really attractive to your students, and we can do all these things. We have to think differently about them. We have to package them differently. We actually have to, to, to deliver on the promise, right? Um, I do think I have a marketing slogan for you to try to prevent students to go to for-profits. There may be something wrong with it, but it's fail with us, it's cheaper. <laughs> well, maybe that's not quite exactly. Maybe not. I've got to work on something in the middle there. 
I don't know. So quickly, the second round of the prize, and I'll, I know I don't have much more time, so I want to finish up. This is like Match Game 77. We added that in, too. Why are blanks so successful? Fill in the blank. You have two groups of students on this campus, by the way, who are already highly successful. There are other groups, too, but these are the two I'm using for the illustration. One, cohort-based CTE students, right? And I love nursing, and I love you people in nursing, but I'm not using nurses as an example because it's selective. But the many other areas we have that are cohort-based CTE programs, you ask them what their overall completion rates are, you hear 65, 70, 75, 80, 85 percent. We know for an average entering student, it's between 20 and 35 percent. That's one really interesting group. The other group, by the way, could not be more different from student, uh, sorry, from cohort-based CTE students. They're classically 18 to 21. They're almost exclusively pre-transfer students. They're almost exclusively kind of that classic, stereotypical recent high school graduate. And they also have, very interestingly, 70, 75, 80% transfer rates. And this group is student athletes. Community college student athletes. Now, we all know there's like the press out there about four-year football and basketball programs and all the stuff that goes on there. But by the way, step back from that for a second. The average graduation rate for NCAA athletes is what in this country? It's close to 81%. It's 20 points higher than it is for entering four-year students at NCAA institutions. But I'm not talking about four-year athletes where there are scholarships and other things. I'm talking about community college athletes. No housing, no scholarships. But if you had that, if I could talk to the athlete, the coaches, talk to the women's basketball coach, hey, how many students transferred out of that last uh, team? 85%, 90%, sometimes 95%. Right, so the question on the table then for round two, to finish up, we're back, surprise. Why are community college athletes and cohort-based CTE students so successful? What draws these, what are the similarities? They could not be more different students. No overlap between the welding program and the women's volleyball team, <laughs> right? Surge tech and football. Like, why is that? Why are they so successful? Okay, here's what we're going to do. 900 people, I love you people. I've got to go quickly anyway. We're going to go bottom up, actually top down. Motivation. You have highly motivated students in both cases. The cohort-based CET students are looking to the industry, sorry, look into industry to get into the, to, to earn that living wage, that family sustaining wage. They're also motivated because they know they're part of a program that they have to get through together. Athletes are motivated by wanting to play at the four-year institution. Potentially motivated by the scholarships that might exist at the four-year institution to pay for the more expensive part of their education. Highly motivated students, they could not be motivated by more different things. So all the research on how motivation is a huge factor in higher ed, born out by two highly successful groups. <coughs> Clear course pads. No surge tech students ever wondered what they're taking in their third semester. They know exactly from day one what they're taking in the surge semester. And the athletes, by the way, are interesting, because all they don't have a two-year program plan figured out, they meet with an athletic counselor at the end of every semester. It tells them exactly what to take the next semester. What's time to degree here at Los Rios for an average entering student? Four and a half years-ish. You know what it is for athletes? It's closer to two. Athletes don't have time, right? They're highly motivated because of another thing that is on the list, which is a ticking time clock. You got five years to play four if you're an athlete, and if you're a cohort-based CTE student, you need to get into that job. You also can't miss a course in your program or you're going to have to wait. So all of these things are relevant. The clear course paths, students don't wonder what they're taking. They're told what they're going to take. I'm going to save one of these for the end. I love, because I love the, the third one's my favorite. We have mandatory support and peer support. If you have a writing problem and you're in the uh, drafting program, the guy who runs the drafting program or the woman who runs the drafting program gets you a help, finds you an English tutor, takes you to the writing center. If you're an athlete, you're in the writing center. You're at tutoring. You're at study hall. Hey, you weren't there. You're not playing. You also have a cohort of your peers who are trying to help you. If you're the starting quarterback on the football team, 98 of the other 99 guys want you to succeed. The other guy's the backup quarterback who wants you to fail. <laughs> so you got peer support from your peers. And I put this on there as a joke originally, but it's actually kind of serious. Uniforms. They travel together. They have a sense of coherence and engagement with the institution, whether it's the, 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 the outfits of the dental hygiene students or it's the basketball program's uniforms, right? You've got these two things going on. Um, so they have a sense of identity. All the folk work that SESI has done, the Center for Student Engagement, about more engaged students being successful. A couple at the end here, 
Discipline and accountability, they're working towards common goals. They have productive persistence and grit. They don't assume that everything's going to go right the first time because they have to work at it. And the final thing they have, which I would say, is a chair or a coach. And this is a really interesting person, right? Because this is an institutional agent who's invested in student success. No one falls through the cracks on a basketball team or a soccer team academically without the coach knowing about it and athletic accountants are being involved. And if you're in the auto tech program, the guy who runs that program knows about you're being in trouble before you do. So someone's invested. Now we hold high standards in both these cases, but someone's working to help you get there. You've got someone at the college on your side. So what I think is fascinating about this, and I, I, I know I didn't talk about guided pathways much, which is intentional. If you look at the reason students are trying to come here, we have economic mobility, we have all the things from the previous slide, and you look at the things that help our students be so successful in the groups who are already successful, what you've done actually is create the underpinnings of guided pathways. And without going into it very often, the four big ideas of guided pathways is that we need to clarify paths for students to help them know what they need to take to get to where they want to go. To, to know that, by the way, we have to know where they're trying to go. So we got to work on number two, helping students get on a path. We're very fond about talking about how students are undecided. But why are, would we be surprised they're undecided when we've done very little, if nothing, to help them decide? You saw it in the videos. Right? Where's career services? It's not that those people in career services have a problem, but where do we put that in a process? How do we maybe use meta majors to explore an area so you can actually have an informed choice about a program? All of that happens there. How do we work on dev ed so people aren't mired in dev ed when they're actually here to do something else, right? Not saying there's anything wrong with math and English faculty or instructors or departments, but the vast majority of those students are not here for math or English. They're here for something else that math and English is important for. And that's an important mindset. And finally, we gotta make sure students are staying on the path and that they're learning. There's a lot behind this, obviously. Um, there's a lot of great research writing out there. Davis Jenkins wrote a book about guided pathways. Um, I wrote a couple of papers in, in uh, response to the book called Guided Pathways Demystified, which walk through some of the most common questions people have about guided pathways. Isn't free choice the cornerstone of American higher education? Don't students benefit by what well, looks like wandering to the observer? That's one of my favorite questions, by the way, because we are the wanderers. Right here. We all are very protective of wandering because it's kind of how we ended up here. The problem with the wandering argument, by the way, as an aside, is it's not working for seven or six out of ten students. Right? And you heard it from the students who are up here. There's a big an assumption all along that students like wandering. Talk to the students. They don't like wandering. You liked wandering. <laughs> right? They actually don't like wandering. Right? They want to get to where they want to go. They want us to help them figure that out. That's why they're flocking to for-profit institutions. Right? So this is a, a really quick look at the kind of underpinnings of the Guided Pathways movement. The, and I would finish with this. Go back in your head to the social justice, economic mobility, and equity regions of this. I could tell the story of Georgia State University, which is probably the first regional for you who's done the most, a 20-point improvement in their graduation rate. And I have these really cool slides. They've eliminated the achievement gap. The, you look at the slides, you go, wow, that's awesome. They did it with no new money. They did it with a more quote unquote challenging student population, which is always thinly veiled code for poor black and brown. They had more of those students, not less, right? And they did all of this with no new money. The students didn't have more money, same SAT scores. But that's all cool, and the slide is cool. But what I want you to leave you with is how many new students start every year in Los Rios, the entire district? 6,000? I'm just going to make it 6,000 because I'm running out of time. There's 6,000 new students who start in Los Rios every year. Right now, if your completion rate's 40%, it means that 2,400 of them will eventually reach their goals. If you were to improve it by 20 points, that's 1,200 student lives a year in every cohort who would reach their goals today when you were done reforming versus what they used to be. That's the Georgia State story. At Georgia State, it's 1,100 students a year who today will graduate who would not have graduated 10 years ago solely because they changed their approach. Systems, structures, policies, cultures. Multiply it by 10, 11,000 students in a decade of new students will now reach their goals primarily, if not exclusively, low-income students and students of color who are not reaching them today. When this gets hard, when this gets controversial, that's why you're doing this work, not because some bozo in a Hawaiian shirt is telling you it's a good idea or Davis wrote a book or some funder did put money behind it. You're doing it because it's actually not okay that six out of ten students who start with us don't finish.
It's not okay, right? And I will leave you with that. Um, I want to make sure we have time for the next presentations, but thank you so much for letting me talk with you briefly. You can find me at rob at ncii-improve.com if you have any questions you want to ask, but thank you guys so much for your time. So the planners made a good choice in inviting Rob, correct? Let's thank Rob again. Rob did such a good job. He's a tough act to follow, and I can't think of that many people who could do it, but our next guest certainly can. I'm very excited to have with us one of the greatest friends our community colleges have in the Sacramento region, the eighth president of Sacramento State, Dr. Robert Nelson. Robert? And Robert, this is another historic part of our convocation, first time that we've had a conversation with the president of Sacramento State at a district-wide convocation. So your path to Sacramento State is fascinating, your path to being a college president. Tell us about that Montana boy who ended up being a college president. Well, I never wanted to be in an administration. I was one of the faculty brats. I headed up the faculty senate for years and years and years, and when they asked me to go into the administration because this little thing called SLOs, Student Learning Outcomes, came about, and we had to convince all the faculty to put them in their syllabi, I said no. I said no seven times, and on the seventh time, the president said, you start Monday. I started Monday. Uh, I was a creative writer. That's what I loved doing. You know, I came off of a ranch, got an education, loved teaching writing, and then I found out that I could make a bigger difference in the administration. I could help 30 kids in my creative writing class. I could put in a new program, and I could help 1,000 kids. And so that's the path. I helped, uh, went, finally ended up on the Rio Grande Valley, some of the poorest areas in America. Um, we are uh, average per capita income of $14,380. Every family we graduated, every student we graduated, we graduated a whole family. So, so the that was it. And uh, those of you who have had a chance to hear Robert know that no one has more passion for students than Ro Robert does. Every time I'm with him, I, I get that energy from him and the commitment to what we do. And now, three years at Sacramento State, uh, I, our conversation started before you even came to California, that uh, when I heard that Robert had been selected as president, we had a nice phone conversation when he was in Texas. I talked to his community college partners. They said wonderful things about you and your commitment to a holistic, community-wide approach. When you got here in July of 2015, you talked relentlessly about one number. You want to talk about that number? I came here because of the diversity of Sacramento, the diversity of Sac State. But when I got here and I found out for 30 years the graduation rate had been 8% for four years and that we weren't even graduating half of our students in six years, I started talking about the dirty secret. And let's pause for a second. You're a new president. You come into a place with a proud tradition the traditional approach would be to celebrate, celebrate the greatness of that place, which is real. Robert did that, but also took a really bold approach where you were telling everyone who would listen that the graduation rate was 8%. What reaction did you get from faculty and staff initially? Uh, shock. Uh, I was surprised how many people didn't really realize it. The wandering that we were talking about, that was really something that everybody wanted to protect. And everybody said our students couldn't do it. They couldn't graduate. They especially said it about our Latino students and our African-American students. Well, today, I can tell you, achievement gap, our Latino students outperformed, graduated in a higher number by 0.5% than our Anglo students did last <laughs> semester. That's a complete turnaround. So let's talk about the turnaround and the steps you've taken where Rob talked about Georgia State and other organizations he's worked with 
that have transformed their organization. That's what you've done at Sacramento State. Talk about some of the changes that have happened in your leadership in the last three years. Well, the first thing, the students couldn't get the classes. They just didn't get the classes. They weren't available. So last semester, we added 671 additional classes for 1,200 additional seats. That completely turned, 12,000 additional seats, what I'm talking about. That completely turned around, they could get the classes. We put every student's degree plan online, and we finally know what classes the students need. Before, we didn't know, we, we relied on anecdotes. We started looking at data to figure out what they wanted to do and where they were gonna go, and, and that made all the difference. The point you made earlier is that the data was not new. The graduation rate had not moved for a lot of years, so it wasn't as if it was exactly a secret. What was the cultural change in using data to guide decision making? It was partly conversations that we had, conversations that we had with the, the superintendents about our students not getting there, about remediation, about all of those problems. We had about 50% of our students taking remedial classes. And we asked why. Well, it was because the test said they were supposed to, right? The assessment said they were supposed to, or the ACT or the SAT said they were supposed to. They didn't need to. Right. We've gone down from 15 per, from 50 percent down to 13 percent in math this year. That's all that took remedial classes. Now we have a new dictate that says no one will be taking remedial classes anymore. That means we have to redevelop the curriculum and we have to do it with the faculty. That's absolutely right, okay? We're redeveloping the curriculum so that we have stretch courses, so that we have concurrent courses, so that the students can graduate. Because they can't graduate in five years or six years even if the first year is wasted taking remedial courses. So many great points to unpack. One point that you talked about is meeting with superintendents. I don't know how many hours you and I have spent together with superintendents around the region, but that is not typical for university presidents to bring in superintendents as peers and have those conversations. Talk a little bit about how you value that conversation with our K-12 partners and really uh, model not a culture of blame, but a uh, culture of partnership with our K-12 superintendents and principals. You have to believe in your students, and you have to believe in the education system in America. I believe in our high schools, I believe in our grade schools, and I'm tired of the blame game because it doesn't get us anywhere. Who are we going to blame? Sac State? We created the teachers. The parents? No. The kids? No. There's no need for that. It's to have conversations, so that's why we've put in uh, classes for, in math and in English in the senior year, so that they can come in seamlessly. We have to do it as partners. You and I, the ADT, the associate degree for transfer is amazing, and I hope you talk all of your students into going in that route if they want to go to Sac State. Because when I got here, we measured when would students graduate if they transferred? We measured in four years. And we were so proud, we said, 75% are gonna graduate in four years. Well, they may have taken three years here and four years there, and that's eight years. That doesn't make any sense. But if they take an associate degrees for transfer, and they come, and we've already got the numbers, in two years, 65% of them are going to graduate. That is an amazing change. And we've talked about the success that Sacramento State and other four-year partners are seeing with the associate degree for transfer students, just celebrating those successes again, that the four-year completion rate uh, for non-ADT students was lower than the two-year completion rate for associate degree for transfer students. Piggybacking on what Rob said, for students of color and students economically challenged, those two years are incredibly valuable in getting to the workforce sooner and changing the lives, not only, as you said, of themselves, but their whole family more quickly. And it's about debt. We heard about the loans, okay? That, that data that came out today is frightening. But it takes, on average, 
$23,000 a year at Sac State for books, tuition, meals, everything, transportation, housing. That's $23,000 extra if they have to take a year of remedial. Or if they don't take 15 credits, that's extra. Our students, when I came, were on average taking 11 credits per semester. That means they're on a six-year track no matter what. Now let's pause for a second, Robert. One conversation about encouraging students to take more units is a concern that their lives are so busy, they're working, they have families. A fear uh, and an understandable concern that they may fail if they take more units. What have you found at Sacramento State in encouraging students to take more units? 84% of the students, when I went to, we started orientation and started bringing the parents into orientation. And I looked at them and I said, how many of you have got $23,000 in chump change in your back pocket? <laughs> because if Madison or Carlos doesn't take 15 credits, that's another $23,000 you're going to have to shell out. Why don't you have them sign this form that says that I'm going to pledge to take 15 credits? 84% of the students signed that. A lot of people said, oh, you're, they're never going to do it. Last year, this last semester, 65% took those 15 credits, and of all of the freshmen, 50.1% took 15 credits and got a C or above. That's 50% of our students that are on track to graduate in four years. Our students can do it. You just have to believe in them. And they're still working on average 20 to 30 hours but they can still do it. You and Sacramento State play an important leadership role for our whole region. Listing different organizations where you are on the board and a key leader, the Greater, Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council, the Valley Vision Board, the Aligned Capital Region Board. The shift in recent years has been towards organizations that are focusing on bringing resources together and alignment and uh, great work being done by all of those three boards. I know there are others you serve on, but let's talk a little bit al about Align Capital Region, the organization that you serve as co-chair, the new organization. Tell a little bit about what your hopes are for Align Capital Region and what the progress has been in the first year or so of its existence. All of us have seen great work done in Sacramento based upon grants. Maybe it's a Gates grant you, that you get. Maybe it's a Lumina grant. Maybe it's a community college uh, foundation grant. But that money goes away. You don't sustain the work that needs to be done. So what do we need to do? We need to put all of our resources together. And that's what Align Capital Region does. We're stronger together. If there's a problem out there that needs to be fixed, we find a way to go fix it. Align Capital Region has a board and then underneath it, it's got an operating committee and a bunch of alignment teams that are trying to fix problems with career readiness, with college attainment, and with community prosperity. We're modeled after Nashville, and I'll give you one success story that they had. They looked and said, we've got to improve the graduation rates for high school students. How are we going to do it? They put out an invitation to participate, and what problem did they find that they wanted to solve? Well, the problem was teenage pregnancy. You can't graduate if you're pregnant very easily. They solved it, and they raised their, tw their graduation rates. We said, OK, we have a problem in Sacramento with young men of color. Why are they not graduating at strong rate? We put out an invitation to participate and said, what are people doing out there? And the problem we discovered was that almost 60% of young African-American boys in preschool drop out because of behavioral problems. Well, you're not going to graduate from high school if you can't make it through preschool. So we're working on that problem right now with all sorts of people's counselors that are involved, 
churches that are involved, individuals that are in counseling, all working together to help parents to prepare those kids. So Align is trying to work together, asking our database of over 8,000 people, how can we solve problems? And the Alliance Capital Region Board does not include just educators like you and me. You want to talk about the power of having business partners at the table? It's so important to have business there. I mean, I totally agree with the presentation that was here just a few minutes ago. People want jobs. They come to us because they want jobs. We have to just admit it. Now, we're going to give them a lot more than that. And that's the beauty of education. But we need the businesses, A, they got money, a little bit important, but B, we need to create those new jobs that are coming forward and our students need to have those skills. So listening to business, listening to what they need helps us to be stronger. So Alliance Capital Region has three overarching goals. Three goals, we want to fix career readiness, okay, and we're working on career pathways. We want to improve the college attainment and certificate attainment and associate degree attainment rates and improve graduation rates. Okay, that's the second one. And the third one is community prosperity. And in community prosperity, we want to deal with mental health, with the arts, making certain that Sacramento is a great place to live. It is a great place to live, isn't it? You're also very active on the Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council, and to some that's a mystery why education and economic development are linked so closely. Can you offer some insights into why you view the work of the Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council as so important? We know that we have an equity problem in this area. We're only going to lift the entire community by creating more jobs, by having good jobs, by bringing educated people together, by being innovative. Working with the Greater Sacramento Economic Council, we have brought in many, many different companies. And we changed some of the curriculum in our, in our um, university. For instance, we brought in one company that's working on blood and uh, studying blood and cancer and everything else. They came, they talked to our faculty, and our faculty changed some of the things they were doing so that the students would be better prepared to be able to do the blood testing that's going to come forward. We can work together with that. When these new companies come in, the first question they ask is, what's your college attainment level? How many bachelor's degrees are out there? We're going to be short 1.1 million bachelor's degrees in the next 10 years if we don't increase. We need to work with government and we need to work with the companies to be able to make sure that we have pathways for them and so that they're successful and they have jobs in the end. How many of us here today look forward to the time where our car doesn't require us to drive it? How many of you are looking forward to that? California is really at ground zero in the development of autonomous vehicles. One discussion going on in our region is the role that, uh, that we could play in higher education. And for Sacramento State and the Los Rios Colleges, being able to respond to the needs of a project like that, really, we, you and I both love UC Davis and our, our friend Gary May, but the truth is that Sacramento State and our community colleges are crucial to providing the men and women who will be working in these new initiatives and, and building on existing businesses and bringing jobs into the region. Do you agree? I absolutely agree. It is a partnership between Sac State, Los Rios, that is going to make all of the difference here in this community. We put out a, a big, it's a, a, a bid, it's a moonshot for Amazon to come. But when we put that together, we talked about creating a central university that would be all of us working together. That's what's going to be the human capital that's really going to make the difference. And so, yes, it is us 
We supply the workforce. We supply the brains. But more importantly, I believe, our students supply the heart of Sacramento. They are the heart. The Amazon Headquarter Project has been a good opportunity for our region to come together and do resource mapping, how we could respond to the need. And you and I had a chance yesterday to spend some time with Mayor Steinberg in a conversation about how to build up the economic strength of our region. And one of the discussion, I believe it was the woman from the Brookings Institution, was that what Amazon is really asking for is a pipeline that would lead to 50,000 trained workers. Yeah. Uh, 50,000 smart trained workers. Yes. And that the goal for the region should be whether you get the Amazon headquarters or not, that should be the North Star to be building the infrastructure to create the pipeline of men and women who can do important work that, that also earns a living wage. Economic development is also educational development. It is the same thing. It is what will help our students, those students that we saw that are not in the top 1%, to be successful and will help their families as well. Earlier you talked about changes at Sacramento State involving developmental or remedial courses. As you know and understand, some of the executive orders from the Chancellor Tim White involving math in particular have generated a lot of interest from community college faculty and staff. Can you talk a little bit about the changes, first of all, with math and CSU? Well, we're not going to do remediation anymore. That we've already talked about. But we're also looking at teaching math differently, using concurrent courses to be able to teach it. For our arts and humanities and our, our creative students and, and for liberal arts students and that, we're talking about teaching math that is mathematical reasoning. For our social sciences students and for our uh, health sciences students, we're talking about teaching statistics and statistical. For our STEM students, we're talking about building towards calc, but having different pathways for different students so that the math reasoning that they have is the reasoning that they actually need on our campus. So we're in the middle of building those courses and they're all coming forward and I'm excited about them. That is an important discussion underway at our colleges, being responsive to the needs of students and, and having the right quantitative class. And historically, intermediate algebra has been a require, requirement for degrees. It's in our educational code. What I hear is that Sacramento State is moving away from that traditional pathway and exploring alternate quantitative methods to meet the needs of students. Is that, is that, that am is I hearing that, right? You just heard it and you just said it right. And earlier, Earlier you talked about the program that we are involved in together to prepare high school seniors. Uh, IRWIC, which stands, you and I are probably not going to get the acronym right. English. Ex no, Expositor Reading. Expository Rhetoric. Come on, help us guys. <laughs> ERWC. Okay. It's putting in a class in the senior year so that the students can take that class and they can transfer automatically into our schools, our colleges, without having to take any remediation or anything like that, and without having to take any assessment tests. And what have the successes been so far, the successes? The students who take these classes pass. Again, I know it sounds radical, I know it sounds crazy, but most of these students that we have made take remedial classes in the past really didn't need them. A test told us that they needed them. We can work with our partners in the high schools, and we can, it, it isn't that, you know, the people who blame the high schools say that they aren't really preparing them. No, it's that our curriculum doesn't align. And when you put our, compo our composition teachers with their English teachers, and they get the alignment, everyone can move very smoothly. Those high school teachers are really good. They have big hearts and they're working hard. And the same is true of the community college professors.
I really appreciate that point that in talking about change, too often it can feel like criticism and the need to change doesn't reflect a lack of passion and commitment on behalf of our faculty and staff, just a reality that our students have different needs. And, and I know you and I have tremendous respect for the work that our faculty does and an understanding that as leaders of our organizations, we can't do anything without the, the faculty being committed to the students the way they are. So I know we both appreciate all that our faculty and staff do and know that these ideas can't be implemented if it's not a shared vision. There's only two of us. That's right. Last time I counted at Sac State, there's over 2,000 of them, of the faculty. And when I say them, I mean it with all the love in my heart. I do. Well, you and but I there, both you've got share. The, how, many, how many faculty do you have? Well, counting full-time and part-time, uh, well over 1,000 faculty. So. Okay, and then how many staff have we got? Uh, over 5,000 employees across our district. So it's a, it's a tremendous group of men and women making the work possible. And you and I both share in our background, we've spent full-time in the classroom. So we understand that the teaching is, is important and challenging and the magic is what happens in the classroom. And I know you and I agree that our role is to support what faculty and staff do and we spend the bulk of our time seeking resources to support you in your work, knowing that the experts in this room are the people making the difference. Well, you know, there are so many cliches, rubber meets the road if, is one, but the real learning takes place in the classroom and at home, but because of what has happened in the classroom and what has done happened one-to-one -one between faculty and students, and we know that. Robert, our schedule would say we're out of time, and I was gonna do some concluding remarks, but I think I'm probably not the only person in the room who would rather hear from you than me. So if you have a few more minutes, we, we're, we're gonna close promptly at 11 and get you to your sessions. But do you mind working with me to sort of wrap up and, and summarize what we've heard so far today? Sure. First of all, the theme that won't go away as far as change, starting at the national level, many of us just live in fear hearing what has happened in D.C. the day before, and today is no exception, where more insanity, insanity and idiocy from D.C., but that's not going to change our commitment to our students here in the Capital Region. And for our DACA students, we're fighting together with our faculty and staff. You are as passionate and, uh, and deeply committed to DACA students as anyone I know. Let's talk about what we can do, that we, we've mobilized the, the experts at our colleges. We're, you have a dream center. We're developing safe places for our students to go, both our dream students and other students. Uh, who are under siege from Washington. Let's talk about finding some hopefulness where there seems to, to not be nearly enough these days at the national level. We heard some of the most vulgar remarks yesterday that have ever been said. We heard racism. <laughs> and we heard hatred. Our students heard it too. When they come back on campus, we need to embrace them and we need to be there for them. They're scared. A lot of them who received their DACA papers have now moved because their information is out there and available. Think about all the Salvadorans want, they're saying, we're going to deport them. Millions. And this is crazy. So what can we do? We can be there to support them. We can help our campuses be strong. At my last uh, convocation, we declared Sac State a hate-free campus. And we will continue to promote that and protect our students and help them. So the national concerns and uh, the, the insanity can cast a cloud over what is happening in our work, but it doesn't diminish our commitment to our students in communicating and demonstrating that we have our students' backs. At the state level, we all have the privilege of living in California, a ray of good news that a federal California district court 
has struck down some of the action for the administration. And in addition, we still have for our students AB 540 and a commitment to students who are immigrants unparalleled by any other state in the nation. So it doesn't take away the, the unpleasantness and the anger that we all share about what's happening at the national level. But at the state level, there is some cause for hope and optimism for what we can do for our students in California. And we have to get the word out there. Um, we're doing a survey right now with Univision uh, to get the word out to parents about AB 540 on the radio stations and everything, everywhere else. Uh, we've got to get, this is an exceptional place to be in California because uh, we are in a situation where you know, we declared the entire state a sanctuary state. You know, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and now we've got a chance to be able to nurture those students and help them. And one of our breakout sessions in uh, a few moments involves the work we are doing together for our DACA students. And I also want to acknowledge the members of our DACA rapid response team. Will everyone who served on our rapid response team please stand so we can acknowledge you? Thank you very much for the work that you were doing. I do want to say one thing. Let's not forget all of our students, OK? All of the students need the same nurturing, the same help as we provide our DACA students. We had the example of athletics just a few minutes ago. The athletes succeed in part because of the motivation, in part because of the support. But if athletes can succeed, everyone can succeed. And all of our students need the same support. And we saw in the comments from our students to a student, there is a person in their experience at our colleges who has reached out and saw something in them. It almost makes, brings a tear to my eye, a student who said that the, the teacher saw something in me I didn't see in myself. Many of us have, have had that experience as a student where someone saw something in us we didn't know that was within us. And the people in this room are reaching out to our students when they come to us next week. You'll have many opportunities to be that person for a student, to reach out and be the one who makes a difference in their life. That is so powerful, and uh, the opportunities will be there throughout the semester. The governor's budget came out on Wednesday. We were discussing yesterday the impact for both CSUs and community colleges. Two headlines in the community college budget that will generate much robust discussion in the coming weeks. One, we've been talking about changes coming in our funding formula. This is the year where there are very significant funding formula proposals change, uh, funding proposals to change our funding formula in the governor's budget where a substantial amount of our funding, if the recommendations are implemented, would be based not just on how many students we enroll, but on how our students do after they enroll. So part of our budget in about a year or so will shift dramatically, not just to how many students we're enrolling, but how many students are completing. We all understand that that sort of change has opportunities and also concerns about unintended consequences. And I think all of you know that one of the advantages of being in Sacramento is we engage very regularly with our policymakers. Last Friday, we had Chancellor Oakley come to a statewide meeting at Los Rios. So we are very much in communication with our statewide chancellor, with our elected officials about what may happen to our funding formula. We will work very hard to communicate with all of you what is happening during this year. It's a very provocative proposal on our funding formula. The second provocative proposal was $120 million, $100 million in one-time funds, and $20 million in ongoing funds to establish a purely online 114th California Community College. We have and will have many discussions about what that means. Also, we have the reality that Governor Brown has been very effective in uh, having his major initiatives funded and it also is an initiative that has the support and partnership of the chancellor's office. So we work hard to have good relationships with the chancellor's office and also with our elected officials, including the governor. So much will happen. This is going to be a very eventful year based on what's happening with those proposals. 
in the big picture, the good news is that there is additional funding for community colleges, not as much for CSUs as is needed, and never enough for our system. But in this very eventful year, we will have the luxury of not having to spend time about uh, talking about how to cut our community college budgets. So many things will be happening, but we need to be thinking very hard about how to invest the money we have now to build the guided pathways so that when the recession that Governor Brown warns us about comes, we will have made investments that will continue to service even when the money is not there the way it is for this budget year. A little different for CSU, uh, not as much new money, and, uh, and we share the challenge of meeting the obligations to our employees, uh, including retirement uh, obligations in particular. It's going to be tough for the CSU, 1.47% uh, uh, increase and, uh, with our other expenses with inflation, with the um, new union contracts, it would be tough. But the promise I make to everyone in this room is we will graduate enough students so there will be slots available for your students to come. So Robert, I, I wanna thank you so much uh, for committing your whole morning. Your schedule is incredible. And I think everyone here understands for Robert to spend this amount of time with us shows how important he views us as a partner. Let's thank Robert Nelson for being with us this morning. Do I at least get to do one stingers up? Let's stand up. How many Sac State alum do we have here today? So Robert is gonna do what he has to do and then I'm gonna finally thank all of you and send you on your way. So Robert, let's first of all do stingers up. Los Rios Colleges and Sac State are number one. Stingers up! Well, thank you, Robert, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Have a great rest of the day, and enjoy your breakout sessions and departmental meetings. Thank you so much.